Let's give another amen for our children today. Amen. Praise God for them and their desire to sing and to serve and for those who work along with them to prepare them uh, for the times that they sing. Amen. amen. You know, children are the lifeblood of the church, and it's just so exciting to see them and so cute to hear them singing uh, praises unto God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We want to continue on and look at uh, the Word of God one more time in the third chapter of Daniel, starting at the first verse. Daniel chapter 3, starting at the first verse. And I will read it in your hearing. Daniel 3, starting at verse 1. We'll take a look at it one more time here. And the word of God says there, I'm reading from the English Standard. You can follow along with me. Daniel 3, the first verse. The king Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the tigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the music of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the tigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The title today is simply, What Will You Worship? What will you worship? Bow your heads with me and pray, please. Father in heaven, I want to thank you. We love you because you have cared for us in such a special way. You have been good, gracious, kind, long-suffering to all of us, Lord. May we please be the same way to each other. And as we look at your word today, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us and that we would worship you and only you. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. You know, I have a friend who served in the Marine Corps, and he was spelling out on Facebook how he had continued to have this recurring dream. He said, last night for the 50th time, I've, I've had this recurring dream of, of going back into the Marine Corps. And he said, every time that I have the dream and I go back into the Marine Corps, he says, everyone that was in the Marine Corps with me has, has advanced in rank. But he says, I keep going back at the same rank. He says, some are sergeants, some are captains, some are majors, majors another a general. But, but I'm just still a, a basic private. Every time that I have this dream, I, I go back and all of my friends and buddies have advanced in rank. But I go back in at the same rank. And he, and he listed on there, he says, what do you think that dream means? You know, of course, none of us can interpret dreams, right? right. You know, so I just threw out some, some, some things that might be plausible. I said, well, well, well maybe it is that, that, that they worked harder than you. <laughs> maybe the dream means that they're just working harder than you. You know, he, he, he's a friend of mine. You know, I'm just playing with him. And I said, well, maybe the dream means that, that, that you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I don't know what the dream means, but, but he had this recurring dream, and, and it keeps coming back, and it's troubling him, and he's trying to find out what does it mean if I keep on having the same dream. And of course, many of us know the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. He has this dream, and, and this dream troubles him so much that, that he wants to know uh, what it means, but he cannot remember what the dream is. And, 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 but he knows that it was something very important, and, and it's keeping him up day and night. It's troubling him. He wants to know what it means. And, and, and you know the story that, that he, he, he tells his wise men uh, to tell him what the dream means and its interpretation. And they go back and forth with King Nebuchadnezzar. You tell us the dream, and we'll tell you its interpretation. And he's like, no, because you're just going to tell me anything. 
Tell me the dream and then tell me how to interpret it. And, and finally Daniel comes after a, a, a bunch of things happen and he interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and you all know the dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed the dream of a statue that was made of different metals. It, it had a head of gold and it goes through a progression of metals and the feet are made with iron and clay. And in the dream a rock that's cut out without hands comes out of nowhere and busts the, the statue up. And, and then this rock becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth and it it represents God's eternal kingdom that will last forever. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar then decides, you know what? I kind of like that image, but I don't like it going from gold to silver to bronze into iron and iron and clay. I'm going to make the entire image out of gold. And then we pick up here in Daniel chapter 3. And it says he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and his breadth was six cubits. It was 60 cubits high and, and six cubits wide. And, and Nebuchadnezzar commands everybody that has a position of leadership in his kingdom to come to the plain of Dura. And when they hear all the music, then they're supposed to bow down to this image. Now, now one thing that we must always remember is that only God has the ability to establish the everlasting. And when God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream, it was a prophecy of things to happen. That his kingdom would last for a little while, and then another kingdom would come after his, and, and another kingdom after that. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't like this prophecy so much, he decided, I'm going to make my own prophecy that my kingdom will last forever. So he makes this image of, uh, uh, of gold from the top to the bottom uh, uh, because, because, because he wanted it to represent his kingdom never, ever coming to an end. See, but, but, but in the dream, in the dream, in the dream, only the head is of gold, right? But when the statue is set up on the plain, the whole statue is of gold, right? See, see in the dream, God set up his eternal kingdom at the end of the prophecy, but, but on the plain of Dura, King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to set up his everlasting kingdom at the beginning of the prophecy. So, so, so Nebuchadnezzar is trying to take the prophecies of God in his own hand and establish the everlasting. See, God always seeks for loyalty, yet we rebel. And, and Nebuchadnezzar demanded loyalty after there was a rebellion in his kingdom. See, 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 history says that, that, that about 10 years after Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon, that there was this great uprising and, and, and there was a coup and some people tried to overthrow him. They, they tried to oust him from office and, and take over the kingdom. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar went through a time when he had to kill a few folk. You know, that, that's what they did in those days, right? If you opposed them, they would kill you. Just imagine if Barack Obama did that today. For all the people that, that oppose him, if he just went off to the whole Republican Party and wiped them all out. <laughs> but that's what Nebuchadnezzar, he went through a time where he killed a bunch of people, and then he said, okay, for the rest of y'all, instead of killing you, I'm going to demand your allegiance. Going to demand your allegiance. And see, in, in Babylon, in their thinking, it, it was not proper for anyone to pledge or, or, or to worship another person. You can only worship a God. And so when Nebuchadnezzar set up this image, it was in the image of their God, Marduk. That was the, the supreme God. They worshiped a lot of gods, but that was the supreme God that they worshiped. And so he made this image in the God of Marduk. And, and, and therefore, if you bow to this image and you gave your worship and authority and, and, and everything to this image, then, then you were also then giving it to, 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 to that God's representative on earth and that was the king so he said you can't bow to me because that would be improper and the people would say we ain't bound to you king so he sets up this image of the God and he says if you bow down to the God then you are then giving me your loyalty because you have to pledge your loyalty to this God's representative on earth and that is me so he sets up this image and see many times our enemy Satan does the same thing See, if Satan were just to show up and say, bow down to me, many of us would say, I'm not bowing down to you. I ain't, I ain't worshiping the devil. You know, who, who in their right mind would do that, right? Who in their right mind would say, I'm going to give my allegiance to Satan himself? 
So what Satan does, he sets up other images that don't look so bad, and then he says, bow down to this. And when you bow down to the images that he sets up, you are in turn giving yourself to him. So, so he sets up uh, uh, these things that, that, that we don't think are, are, are so bad that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we live this life and, and we ought to chase after money because, because money is a symbol of success. And then we give our loyalty and our allegiance to chasing after money. And when we are chasing after money instead of chasing after God, we are then giving our allegiance to Satan himself. We chase after material possessions. Because we think that gives us self-worth and it gives us status in life. When, when we chase after uh, a member of the opposite sex because uh, we, we, we are trying to lose ourselves and someone else because we believe that they can make us happy. When we chase after all these images that Satan sets up, we are then giving our allegiance over to him instead of bowing down to him himself. And so King Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly what he was doing. He sets up this image because there was rebellion in his kingdom. And he said, if you don't bow down to it, the rest of y'all are going to die. And so when the music struck, folk were dropping like flies, bowing down to this image. But remember, only God has the ability to establish the everlasting, right? Listen to this, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Daniel 2 and verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So Nebuchadnezzar made this image of all gold, saying that my kingdom is going to last forever, but no matter what Nebuchadnezzar did, God had already ordained that his kingdom would be the only kingdom to last forever. No matter what man did with their kingdoms, their kingdoms would always ultimately come to an end. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom came to an end in Daniel chapter 5. After that, the Medes and Persians reigned for a while. I'm sure they were saying, we're going to have an everlasting kingdom, but their kingdom came to an end. And then the Greeks set up, and, and I'm sure they said, we're going to have an everlasting kingdom. Then the Romans came along and, and were saying the same thing, that, that our kingdom is going to last forever. Uh, no one shall overthrow it. Then a bunch of barbaric nations came and, and, and crumbled the Roman kingdom. Man is always trying to set up something that will last forever, but only God can establish the everlasting but see, we oftentimes impersonate Nebuchadnezzar in the sense that we try to establish the everlasting. See, despite, uh, uh, follow me, see, despite God's plan, Nebuchadnezzar had his own ambitions, and so do we. See, we try as hard as Nebuchadnezzar did to force things that are destined to fail. For example, sometimes we try to force relationships. See, if, if your relationship with a member of the opposite sex is outside of God's will, you're only asking for trouble if you try to force it. It's destined to fail uh, because only God can establish the everlasting. Another example is living above your means. If you try to force a status of life that is beyond what God has blessed you with, it's only a matter of time before your finances give way to the reality that only God can establish the everlasting. And so in our personal lives, uh, we try to force the everlasting. We try to make things happen that God never ordained, things that are outside of God's will. And when we do that, they are destined to fail because only God can establish the everlasting. Do you all remember how Babylon fell, how it was conquered? In Daniel chapter 5, remember Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar he was having a party and, and he had he, you know, he was so drunk, he said, bring all the vessels uh, from the temple in Jerusalem that, uh, you know, when they busted down the temple, they brought out all the vessels of gold and silver. And, and he said, bring those to the party and, and let's drink out of these vessels. And, and he was having a good time and, and all of a sudden a hand, it was just a hand that wasn't attached to anything, began to write on the wall, many, many tickle you farson. You all remember that? And it said that, that your days are, are, are numbered, uh, that you've been weighed in the balances and, and found wanting. And, and, and in history, what happened was that, that there, was, there was a river that flowed through Babylon. And, and, and Babylon was, was this city, and it was, it was protected by these great big walls, and the river flowed under one of the walls. 
And, and so while everybody was partying and having a good time, thinking that they were protected by these walls, the Medes and the Persians were outside redirecting the river. And, and unbeknownst to the people partying, the river was redirected, and then the Medes and the Persians came in under the wall on dry ground, came inside, and busted down the city. See, see, just like Babylon fell because the drying of the river was overlooked as a potential threat, they didn't even think about it. They, they had overlooked it as a potential threat. There are things that you'll overlook as you try to force the everlasting, and these things will come back to bite you later. See, 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 yeah, you can afford it initially, but, but what about the maintenance and the upkeep? That'll come back to bite you later. Yeah, chilling with that person is fun in the beginning, but what about the emotional pain that you have to continue to endure every time you think about how they did you wrong in the end? There, there's always something that, that you haven't thought about that'll come back to bite you in the end when you try to force the everlasting and set up things in ways that God has not ordained them to be. Now, 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 the Bible says that the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up was of, was of gold, right? Said that it was of gold. Well, 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 well let's, let's examine that for a moment. Remember Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow down to the image, you're going to be thrown into a, a furnace, a burning, fiery furnace. Remember that? And he says, I'm going to make it hot, seven times hotter than it normally is. And I've often wondered, how can, how can, how can you make fire seven times hotter than fire? That doesn't make much sense. But remember, remember Babylon, the, 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 the region of the world that Babylon was in, it's in the Middle East, and there's a lot of what in the Middle East? A lot of oil in the Middle East, right? And, and so Nebuchadnezzar is able to take advantage of this oil to make the, the fire even hotter. Just throw some oil on you and let you burn up real good. But those furnaces weren't there just to be torture devices. The furnaces on the plain of Dur were there for brick making. They would take clay, put them in the, in the furnace, dry out the clay, and make bricks. So this, so this image that is of gold, what is typical of, of things that are made of gold in those days or silver in those days is that they're usually clay or rock or wood just overlaid with gold. Do you follow me? See, in those days, it was common practice to take things of clay or wood and overlay them with gold. Even the Ark of the Covenant that was in the most holy place was wood overlaid with gold. Take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 19. Remember, this thing is six cubits wide and, and 60 cubits high. It's almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Not as tall, but almost as tall. If it was pure gold, that'd be a lot of gold. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 19. Say amen when you get there. Isaiah 40, 19. This is what it says. In idol, before that it's saying, what would you liken God to? In idol, listen to this, a craftsman cast it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and cast it for silver chains. You see that? It's talking about putting it on a, on a necklace, that you make it of something, clay or something, overlay it with gold and put it on a necklace. Uh, that's, that's what they would do with idols. So, so, so this text in the Bible is letting us know the common practice of those days was to make something maybe of stone or of wood or of clay and then overlay it with gold. So, so, so the statue that was of gold, it was shiny on the outside. It had this rare metal, this gold on the outside. It, it was glistening in the sun with the blinding reflection. It must have been beautiful to behold, polished and priceless on the outside, but it was nothing more than worthless clay on the inside. Chances are it was not pure gold all the way through. That would be a lot of gold to make a statue that big. And in those areas with those furnaces, they were making bricks. So with those furnaces, they, 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 they made this image of clay and they overlaid it with gold. It was coated of the most precious and rarest metals on the outside, but its core makeup was nothing more than hardened dirt. See, the many, t many times the things that we chase after and give our time and, and attention and, and affection. Uh, many times the things that, uh, that we end up worshiping are nice and pretty on the outside, but their core makeup is worthless. 
We spend time chasing after things that are pretty, that are cute, that are pleasing to the eye, that are full of bling and and they glisten in the sun, but they are empty and worthless as clay on the inside. See, see, see that guy that you think is all that? The one that isn't interested in going to church. He thinks he's player player, and he might be all that on the outside, but chances are his core makeup is worthless on the inside. See, that girl is fine on the outside. Woo! Face is nice to look at, and her figure is sweet. Her hair and nails are always done, uh, 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 but you love to have her on your arm when, when other men come around because it just makes you feel good to have a good woman with you, but, but you better be careful that you get hooked up with somebody that's pretty on the outside but worthless as clay on the inside. We chase after all these things, and they are, they are empty and valueless on the inside. See, some of you have been looking at the things that other people have. You've been coveting somebody else's life, wishing that you had a life like theirs, thinking that they have it all, thinking that everything is perfect in their life, but you don't know the pain and the travail that they work hard to cover up. Do you think their life is pretty on the outside? Because you're on the outside looking in. But on the inside, they're dealing with pain and in hardship, wishing they had your life. <laughs> See, not everything that glitters is gold. It just might be triple gold plated, <laughs> but it ain't nothing but worthless clay on the inside. So you got to be careful what you desire, what you lust after, what you worship. Because you could be worshiping something that is worthless and lifeless. You should be worshiping God, the only living God. Amen? Amen? See, many times we turn away from God and we give our worship to other things and those things. Yeah, they glitter. But only God should get our worship, our praise, our affection, and our adoration. Look at, look at Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1 again. It says that King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, we read it, whose height was how many cubits? I'll wait for you to get there. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. He said he, he made an image of gold, his height was, was, was how big? 60 cubits, right? And his breadth was how, how, how wide? Six cubits, right? He said he set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, now, in, in, in Babylon, they, they had a, a, a system of counting that was based on sixes. It's, it's, it's called a, a sexagismal system. I don't even want you to try to repeat that. <laughs> I'll be saying all kinds of stuff today. We have a decimal system, right? That's based on tens. The sexagismal system is based on sixes. That's where we get 60 seconds and 60 minutes. It's based on this Babylonian system of, 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 of sixes. And, and, and so, so that he made this image of six cubits wide and, and 60 cubits high, and, 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 and it represented his type of perfection. Now, in the Bible, what number is associated with God's perfection? The number seven, right? So Nebuchadnezzar makes this image of gold, we know it's mostly clay, coated in gold on the outside, but, but it, is, it falls short of God's perfection. It might have been pretty, but it fell short of God's perfection. Might have been nice to look at, but it fell short of God's perfection. And many of the things that we chase after fall short of God's perfection because it isn't what God had set up for us. And so God has, has, has he has this, this, uh, this number of, of perfection or he, he has this idea of perfection. He has uh, things that he set in order and he says that this is good and, and, and we find ourselves because the devil is dangling these things in front of us like a carrot. We are chasing after things that, that do not meet God's perfection. 
And, and so all the people that were on the plane that day, because of fear, they were willing to bow down to something that was imperfect, even though it was pretty. What are you looking at that falls short of God's perfection? What are you worshiping that falls short of God's perfection? It might be pretty. It might be pleasurable. It might look like it's all that and that is going to do something wonderful for you. But in the end, if it's outside of God's will, it falls short of his perfection. See, when you fail to give God his day, and in your mind you say, I can worship God every day. You ought to worship God every day. But see, but, 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 but the crime is in when you don't recognize the day that God said to set aside everything else and worship me. And so when you just try to give God what you think is, is good, then you are falling short of God's perfection. When the, when the word says whatsoever things are good and pure and holy and of good report, think on these things, but, but you allow all kind of other things into your home and into your mind, you are falling short of God's perfection. What kinds of things have you allowed to creep in? And it might be close. See, six is close to seven. It might be close to God's perfection, but, but if it ain't there, if it's not 100%, we're not talking about 99.9. .9, only 100% will do, amen? It might look close, but in the end, it still falls short. Then you ought to leave it alone. Check out Daniel chapter 2 and verse 47. We'll be done here pretty soon. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 47. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 47. This is after Nebuchadnezzar. He had this dream. It was troubling him. His wise men couldn't tell him a thing. Daniel shows up and breaks it all down to him. And then Nebuchadnezzar makes this declaration in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 47. After he understands the dream and he's all happy with Daniel and he's like, give Daniel a bunch of gifts. And then in 247 he says, the king answered and said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of God. This is out of Nebuchadnezzar's own mouth. Your God is Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. So, 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 so Nebuchadnezzar basically declares that God is God. He makes this declaration. There's no mistaking it. But shortly after he makes that declaration, he sets up this image in the plain of Dura and demands that everyone bow down to it. Now hold on, Neb, which is it? You just declared that God is God, but then you go make a false God and tell everyone to bow down to it, and if they don't, you're going to kill them. He makes this God, despite knowing that God was going to destroy all idol-worshiping nations. That's where the progression of the statue. Everyone that worships anything but him is going to be destroyed. See, we often make declarations about God after we've had memorable experiences with him. God does something for us. We like, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is good, and, and we can't wait to testify and, and to tell someone what God has done. You know what I'm saying? You, 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 know, you, you didn't know how you're going to pay a bill, and all of a sudden the bill gets paid, and you're like, woo, thank you, Jesus. You know, you're about to get into an accident, and, and somehow God took control of the car and steered you around that thing, and he, you are praising God for what he's done. Am I right? Uh, you were sick and, and you thought you were going to have to take some days off work and you know you can't afford that, but, but God gave you the strength to go to work anyhow and, and you made it through. You're like, thank you, Jesus. You, you thought you were about to box your child. Because they were just hard-headed. And the Lord changed something in that head of that child <laughs> and saved him from getting beat down. You're like, thank you, Jesus. And I didn't have to beat down my own kid. You are praising God for the experiences that you've had with him, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. God worked out this dream and gave him the interpretation, and he's like, God is God, and he's Lord of kings. But then he goes and makes this image of a false God. And we do the same thing. We make declarations about God 
but shortly after we go back to doing ungodly things and allowing other things to be gods and lords in our lives. We go back to giving homage to other idols. See, when Nebuchadnezzar demanded that everyone bow down to the image, he never required them to denounce any other god. And this is due to Nebuchadnezzar's belief that it was okay to worship multiple gods. So he says, I don't care what else you worship as long as you bow down to this god. Because when you bow down to this god, you give homage to me. Nebuchadnezzar was a polytheist, meaning that he, he, he gave worship and homage to many gods. Aren't we the same way? How else could we come to church and worship God, but then shortly after leave this place and, and, and serve the gods of pleasure and excitement during the week? How else could we make a declaration about God and how good he's been in our lives saying that we're going to serve him and, and saying that we love him but then turn and engage in other activities that are outside of his will. The only way that we could possibly do it is that we believe that it's okay to serve multiple gods. And the enemy is saying to us, I don't care if you worship God. Just as long as you worship these other gods that I put in your life. Satan never says denounce God and just simply turn away from him. Just be a polytheist and give yourself to all these other things that I put in your life. Chase after pleasure and chase after money and, and chase after material things. I don't care if you go to church and you're a deacon in the church, you're an elder in the church, you, you sing in the choir and you get up and you praise and, and you pray. He says, I don't care about that just as long as you give yourself to all these other things that I'm dangling in front of you. And, and so, so in a sense, subconsciously, we have become polytheist. And we're walking around giving worship to multiple gods. When God says, Serve me and only me. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Am I right? Matter of fact, Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke chapter 4 and verse 8 says, you shall worship the Lord your God. And him only shalt thou serve. Joshua said it best in Joshua 24 verse 15 when he said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So my question to you all today is who will you worship? Will you worship God and only God? Or will you worship the semblance of other gods? Therefore, given your allegiance to the enemy of God himself. Who will you worship today? I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. Just close your eyes and, and in the silence of your own thoughts, just contemplate where your worship has been going. Is your worship going to money? Is that the thing that's on your mind constantly? How can I get more and more and more? You never have enough. Is it the chasing after material things? I, oh, I wish I had that TV. Oh, I wish I had those clothes. Oh, oh I, I wish I had that, uh, that, that new VCR, the DVD, the Xbox. Well, what is on your mind? What things are you chasing after? Is it after success? That your number one goal in life is for others to believe that you're successful? Is it after pleasure? That I just want to feel good in everything that I do? What are you chasing after? What other images has Satan set up that you give your homage and your allegiance to? I pray that you've made up your mind today that you're going to serve God and him only. 
that you've declared today that I am not a polytheist believing in all these other gods. I will serve God and God alone. Because remember, all these other things are just plated in gold on the outside. But they are as worthless as clay on the inside. And in the end, they're all going to burn up. They might be close to God's perfection because that's what the enemy does when he sets up a counterfeit. He tries to make it as close as possible, but it always falls short of God's perfection. What have you been giving your allegiance to? I pray that you give it to God. If that's your desire today, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you are. You're saying, God, I want to give you my allegiance, you and you alone, to nothing else. I don't want to bow down to any images that are attached to the enemy himself. I don't want to give myself to anything that falls short of your perfection. And I certainly don't want to wrap my arms of love and affection around something that is empty on the inside. But Lord, I want to give it all to you. That's why you're standing today. By standing, you are declaring like Joshua that, that, that for me and mine, we're going to serve the Lord. Who will you serve today? Father in heaven, you see your people standing. And you know the, de the declaration they make as they stand right now. That they're going to serve you and you only. Lord, we don't want to serve any graven images. We don't want to serve anything made by the hands of men. We don't want to serve anything conjured up in the mind of man. We want to, under we want to serve you who cannot even be understood by man. Lord, you are, you are an awesome God. Uh, you are a, a loving God. You are a living God. Lord, we're standing today saying that we love you and we're going to serve you and you only. Lord, many of us need to be forgiven right now because we have been chasing after other things. And when the enemy said bow, we dropped to our knees and we worshiped. When we heard the word, we fell down. Like, like many others that were on the plane that day, folk were just looking around and saying, if they bow, I might as well do the same. But I pray that today we would be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and stand despite everyone else in society bowing down to the images of the evil one. Lord, give us the, 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 the strength that only comes from heaven to stand even though it's unpopular and even though we might be ridiculed. Give us the strength to stand even though we might miss out on something in the meantime because we know that in the end we shall get the greater blessing. Give us the strength to stand, Lord, and to give our worship to you and to only you. We thank you, Lord, for the words of today, for the praise of today, and for the fellowship of today. We pray that today you would seal these decisions that we make for you. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. And amen. Praise God, everyone.